We got very low on water and food in the Pacific that was much slower than we anticipated. The first time I went to Beverage Reef, we stayed until the food and water was running very low, anticipating a certain length of time to get to Tonga. But of course, the weather didn't play ball, so it actually took longer, and then we were really pretty desperate. <laughs> Welcome to Fruiting Body Podcast. Today, we have an absolute legend of a guest. This is Pete Atkinson. Now, we're going to be talking all about Pete's journey in 1983 on a 1935 yacht sailing from the UK to the South Pacific. Essentially, this is probably one of the first people that have kind of left that rat race and escaped and took control of their whole life. So we're going to learn all about why did he go to the South Pacific? What was he doing there? And what led him to Phuket? Now, before we get started, we are Fruiting Body Podcast, but we're doing Fruiting Body Mushrooms, uh, stuff like lion's mane, reishi, cordyceps. So you can check out links in the description uh, if you're interested in all that fun stuff. If you're tired of me rambling, I have chapters below so you can navigate uh, this podcast mu podcast much more seamlessly. Do not forget to like, subscribe. I think we're pushing about 4,000 subs, something like that, uh, helping us grow in the algorithm. But more importantly, if you can share this, if you're sharing this podcast, it's really going to get us going. Um, okay, so without further ado, we're going to get this started with Pete Atkinson. Okay, Pete, thanks a lot for joining. You're very welcome. Nice yeah. to be here. Now, did I pronounce the last name correct? Pete At 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 Atkinson. Yeah, oh, okay. Atkinson. Sometimes I, I forget to double check with the guests and then I like, I'll mess it up and I don't want to shoot it again. So we roll with it. <laughs> um, as we do in the Fruiting Body podcast, we want to learn about your journey. And as I explained at the beginning in the intro, you might be maybe the first to really escape that rat race. Now, obviously there was no digital tech back then. So you're not, you weren't the first digital nomad, but let's go all the way back. 1983, you're purchasing a yacht. It's a 1935 yacht. Tell us about that story. How did that come together and what kind of went into that decision? Um, I've always had a sort of genetic defect in that I've been obsessed by fish and fishing since I was very, very young. And then I, when I was a, an early teenager, I wanted to be um, a, a trawler man. And then I, as soon as Jacques Cousteau was on the telly, I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau because I thought he had a pretty nice life. So swanning around on a, a boat, filming underwater, diving and exploring. So um, I, I uh, managed to get into Bangor University to, to, to study marine zoology. Um, okay, is that better? Um, you can hear it, Hans. Can you hear the levels okay? Okay. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, st I started um, a marine biology degree and I built a second underwater camera housing to take pictures underwater, as one does. And um, when I graduated, it was the first time in my life that education was interesting. And um, I got a good degree. I got a job in the zoology department as a technician. And on the strength of that, I was able to buy a three-bedroom house in North Wales, £5,300. That was back in the day. And it was a ruin. So I spent um, a few years renovating it with the help of my girlfriend at the time. And when it sold, I went looking for a boat. Now, I had no sailing experience, really. I'd read lots of books long before YouTube and the Internet. And um, uh, I found the boat in Lymington for £11,000, the one on the back of the book, 35 foot, built in 1935, no refrigeration leaked badly and uh, so I bought it and that became my home for the next 17 years and um, so that first year I fixed it up a bit and sailed to Ireland to find out if I could sail came back and worked on a dredging barge over the winter and then the following year I, I sailed to um, Spain and Portugal and my girlfriend had just finished her PhD um, at Brunel University and she came out to Portugal to, to join me to sail across the Atlantic. So um, we got to, um, well, we made landfall in Barbados and then sailed up the Antilles to Antigua where we got work on a, a motor yacht for a year. 
And um, she had the good sense to fall in love with somebody taller, better looking, bigger boat, wealthier than me. So when I left Antigua, that I, I sailed alone to Panama and then into the Pacific. And that was really the start of my adventure <clears throat> in 1985. Uh, just a quick shout out to Five Star Marine and Sean Stenning. Five Star Marine, they're a sponsor on this podcast. So they're just helping us with the production and allowing us to make this content on a week to week ba basis to give it back to you guys, telling you these stories about people living not just in Phuket, but in Thailand. Uh, if you want to go check them out, it's on Instagram at Five Star Marine Phuket. And uh, we'll also leave links in the description. A little bit about who they are they are a VIP private char uh, speedboat chartered tour on the island of Phuket. So they're taking you to places like Koh Leap Bay, Krabi, Pang Na Bay. Uh, you have complete control over your own trip, which most of other services are not authoring that up, uh, sorry, offering that. So Hans will probably throw up a QR code. You can scan that as well, or links are in the, in the descriptions. Go check them out. Let them know if we sent you there. It just helps us grow this podcast. So let's get back to the podcast. How did you make that decision? Oh, you're going down Panama. Now you went through the Panama, Panama Canal and what? I, I'm just going to keep going that way. Well, you, you can't really turn around and come back because the trade winds are blowing that way. So you, you're, you're committed, you know, once you go through the canal. And I wanted to go to French Polynesia. I wanted to go to the, the reefs in the South Pacific and Tonga and places like that. And, but it was, it was quite a big step. I had no, um, I had a VHF radio by then, but when I crossed the Atlantic, I had no VHF radio, no life raft, no in-date flares, a plastic sextant that I bought for 20 quid at Bewley Boat Jumble. So, I had no insurance because when I set out to cross the Atlantic, um, I inquired about insurance and they said, well, you need three people on board, one with ocean navigation experience, and the premium will be this much, which was about a quarter of the value of the boat. So I thought, oh, well, that's, that makes the decision really easy. I won't have insurance. And I never insured any boat in 23 years. And uh, you know, I think if you're reasonably careful you can you know in a lifetime of no insurance you can mm. probably end out a, end up ahead but you so you had no formal training and you're sell, setting sail out to the south pacific from kind of south central america um was this purely because you wanted to to explore the french polynesian and and your your passion and love for fish as well or how did that all connect like why french polynesia well i i, I guess at one stage I, I wanted to sail around the world and that was the way to do it in in those days um but of course the allure of the south pacific meant that i didn't get any further really because it's paradise or it was paradise when when i was there I was lucky enough to spend a year in French Polynesia, that first visit. Um, so I spent a, a hurricane season there and a, a normal season. And then sailed um, to the Cook Islands. And there I, um, I, I was on my own in Atutaki in the Cook Islands. And I met a Canadian backpacker called Vicky. And uh, I said, um, do you want to sail to New Zealand with me? And she said, yes, of course. And she stayed on the boat for eight years, uh, no refrigeration, imagine, and and a kerosene oven that she used to bake in. So she was she was pretty tough and put up with a lot. And she did dive, but she didn't dive much. So most of my diving was alone. And the thing about Polynesia is the the water is clear usually, and the marine life is fabulous. And then from the Cook Islands, we went to um, Beveridge Reef, which is my favorite place in the Pacific. It's an oceanic reef, four miles long, two miles wide. Very, very clear water, 60 meter visibility, lots of sharks. And if you feed them, they behave very well. So we'd, we'd take down bits of fish in a plastic box and uh, there'd be current coming across the reef. So you could jam some fish in the coral and the smell corridor would be going that way, and the sun was up there, and you think, okay, well, the shark's going to come this way, and I want the picture to be like such and such. Of course, this was all on film long before digital. So 
you shoot a pigeon, you have no idea whether it would be any good or the exposure is right until a month or two later sometimes. So it was quite challenging. Mm. But, um, you know, when I, was, uh, when I left England, I submitted um, images to a picture library uh, with the hope of making some money from stock photography. And I started in 1986, I was writing articles for magazines. <clears throat> and um, that became my living. And eventually I was accepted by Getty Images. And my income just went stratospheric for me because my costs were very low. I had no tax to pay anywhere because I was living offshore. And, um, you know, life was fine and dandy. How would you handle like the business side of that? Meaning you're taking the pictures for Getty in the, in the middle of the French Polynesian and you need yeah. to get them to them. And how are they getting you the cash? What's the transaction process? Yeah, it, it really depended then on my parents being alive, which they were at the time. So I would send transparencies to Getty um, and they would keep the ones they wanted and send the ones they didn't want back to my father. And when... I got paid, it would go into a, a UK account, a Jersey account. Um, and that changed over the years. Of course, digital transformed everything. And uh, it made it much easier to deliver pictures um, and take lots of great pictures, but everybody else could also take lots of great pictures. So the value of pictures went down and down and down and to, to virtually nothing. Mm. So last year I withdrew from Getty and I have my own stock on my website now. But So it was sort of the end of an era. But I, I caught the, the tail end of the, the stock photo industry. Well, let's, let's take a step back to the beginning of the journey. You're leaving from Pan Panama Canal and you're heading out to the French Polynesian. What was your preparation and process for this, this next leg? How long was that journey, and where did you stop first? Um, well, it was 34 days, and in Panama I stocked up on, on food. So on a boat you'd have tin food, dried food. Cabbage would last a month. Um, eggs would last a month if you'd greased them or turned them to keep the shells moist on the inside. Potatoes would last a month. Onions would last a month. So, but... You know, I ate a lot of rice and sardines. <clears throat> um, a doctor friend of mine used to call it rice and grey sauce. And I just learned recently that I could have rebranded it paella and uh, it would have tasted much better. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, a sea you fish with a, you tow a lure, but everything you catch is a metre long. So you, with no refrigeration, you eat fish for breakfast, lunch and dinner for two days. And then you don't want to fish for another two weeks. <clears throat> so, um, but yeah, I, I managed to survive and stay reasonably healthy. And of course I self-medicated because, you know, if you're at sea and you damage yourself or you get some sort of infection, then you need antibiotics. And, you know, I, I had sutures and staplers and things on board. Um, but were you facing any major problems, storms where it, it caused issues? Um, not on that trip, but uh, I've had some, in, in the Canaries with, with my girlfriend, we had 70 knot winds, but flat seas. And that was pretty scary because there was, I had a wind generator on the boat for electricity and one of the struts holding it up broke in the storm. And then the, the um, blades of the, wind generator hit, hit the backstay and broke. And then we had a wind generator with four, four adjacent blades and two missing, still going round and round, trying to shake the whole boat apart. Um, and that was interesting. But yeah, I had a very bad storm south of Rarotonga. Um, and quite a lot of bad weather. I mean, the thing about sailing is that living on a boat in the tropics is paradise. And when it's nice, it's really, really nice. But when it's horrible, it's really horrible. Were you prepared for that? Like when a massive storm was coming through, you've done your research, you, you were able to hunker down? Um, no, not really. Um, all you can do at sea is reduce sail. 
and quite often I'd, I'd just lay um, under bare poles, I even no sail. If the wind was just gale force, you could heave to where you, you adjust the sail so the boat sort of sits and bobs over the waves. Um, but I had no weather information because I had no long-range radio. And the, the thing about having weather information is that it doesn't really help you because the systems are moving at 25 knots and you're moving at 5 knots. So unless it's a hurricane with a very small centre, you, you're not going to avoid it anyway. And, you, you know, I try not to be out in hurricane season in places where I would be vulnerable. So generally offshore, you're pretty pretty safe. And when I spent cyclone season in the tropics, then I would try and be in a place where there were mangroves and mangrove rivers where you could get in and tie tie into it. And uh, but I never had a very a very severe um, encounter with that. That that first leg from Panama going to the French Polynesians. Now on the way is Easter Island. Were you able to stop by? Have you ever been? No, and it's not really on the way. I'm much, much, much further north than Easter okay. Island. But I did see the Galapagos as I went past. And in those days, uh, you couldn't get water there, and you could only stop for seventy two hours. If you wanted to go to the other islands, you needed to have a guide on board. So you needed to provide accommodation and food. And my boat was pretty small. So that was, you know, for a zoologist to stop there for 72 hours, I thought it was a travesty, and <laughs> I, I kept on going. Now, that's because of, like, park regulations. They're pushing you along, or? Yeah, I, it, it was difficult, and because there was no water, I only carried 35 gallons on the boat. Um, I didn't have water to spare, really. Did you ever get down to mm, risky levels or critical levels where... Uh, maybe you had to take certain measures to be sure things didn't go, you know, shit didn't hit the fan. Um, I don't, I don't recall. That. I mean, we got very low on water and food on one or two trips in the Pacific that was much slower than we anticipated. Um, but I don't think we ran, ran out of water. I mean, the first time I went to Beverage Reef, we wanted to stay there as long as possible. Um, so that we we stayed until the food and water was running very low, anticipating a certain length of time to get to Mukalofa in Tonga. Um, but of course, the weather didn't play ball, so it actually took longer. And then we were really pretty desperate <laughs> in the food stakes by the time we were, got there. Were you using the stars to kind of navigate to get around? The stars and the sun and the moon. And how did you have material that you kind of prepared that could... Well, you have um, an almanac and um, tables. And um, the almanac is a sort of yearly diary. And you need accurate time, and you measure the elevation of the sun above the horizon. And that doesn't give you a position. It just gives you a position line on a chart, which you can draw with a pencil. And then you sail for four or five hours, and you know roughly the direction you're sailing and how far you've gone. And then you do another side and you get another line, but it will cross the first line. So you move the first line, the distance you've traveled in the direction you, you use it using parallel rulers. And where they, they cross then is, is approximately your position. And w were you sailing at night as well to follow yeah. the stars? I, w I wouldn't follow the stars, um, but I could use them to navigate. But you can only do that at dawn and dusk because you need to measure the angle between the star and the horizon. So you have to be able to see the horizon. Um, but you, I'd sail 24 hours a day. I had a self-steering gear that would steer the boat. So I almost never steered by hand. Um, but it depended on the, on the wind. Um, it, if you were motoring, it wouldn't work. Um, and it, it was a sort of complicated mechanism, but it, it worked very, very well. When you're staring out across the horizon and, and you're navigating in the sense, um, are you able to officially say flat earthers are both are complete full of shit? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, lots of people are full of shit for different reasons. They just full of shit for that particular reason. But they're not unique in believing nonsense. And it's 
it's hard to really believe that anybody that's not mentally defective could believe that the earth is flat because it's so easy to disprove. Um, yeah, even even that, it's uh, it's a bit mind blowing when they they try to come out and uh, say the Earth is flat. I, I personally, I don't get it. I mean, we've all been on an airplane. We exactly, see, we exactly. see the curvature of the Earth. But you know, the, when you consider how many people are religious, this is maybe more dangerous ground. Um, it, it's in the human psyche to believe things that are convenient, but not necessarily true. And, you know, the flat earth is one example and a belief in an external God is another. I, well, I, would I mean, the flat earth theory was originated by the Catholic Church. They didn't want people sailing out to sea and discovering, you know, new ideas, new adventures. So they said you'd fall off the edge of the earth. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize that. But uh, you'd think that they would be interested in just so they got more people to convert and tithe I mean, see, my theory is the religion at that time, uh, say the Catholic Church, that that was that was just their television. They didn't have now today we have television that can program us. Well, we didn't have television back then. So everyone went to the church and that was your programming. And that's pretty much what, what I and then I think that was probably dictated by the kings or the powers above. And they decided what information we had to program this week on Sunday. And that's kind of how that that probably was the purpose of it. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> <laughs> um, now you're sailing around in the South Pacific. You're, you're doing this for plus 20 years. At which point did you ever have a breakdown and say, you know what, maybe it's time to go back to civilization or was every day a gift? Um, both. Well, one of the great advantages I had was that I wasn't qualified to do anything useful or interesting. You know, a degree in marine biology, the, the kind of jobs I could have got were not particularly interested, interesting for me. Diving in with sharks and whales and photographing, that interested me. So the temptation to, to sort of have a real life was, was limited. But eventually I, I got sort of tired of having to move. You know, every four months or every six months when the visa expired, I had to sail on somewhere else. And sometimes I'd sail back to French Polynesia from New Zealand, for example. Um, yeah, so I, I was sort of looking for a, a base in the South Pacific where I, I didn't have to keep moving. And I was in London um, at the Natural History Museum for a, a photography competition. And I ran into a German guy who I knew and... Um, he said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm living in Australia, in Cairns. Um, I got a distinguished talent visa for Australia. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I've never heard of a distinguished talent visa. <laughs> and in those days, I was um, making reasonable money and winning competitions and, and things like that. Um, so I thought, well, I'll have a go and see if I can. And uh, anyway, I applied for it in about 2003 was accepted in 2004 and sailed to Cairns and by then I had a, a bigger boat um, a 44 foot aluminium boat that I'd bought in New Zealand and that was great because it, for the first time in my life I had dry office space on the um, on the sea so the first thing I did I put an electric piano in the four peak so I could play the piano and <laughs> um, so anyway, I got to Australia to Cairns and put the boat up for sale and uh, bought a house with a swimming pool, as one does, and tried to settle down. And that was confronting. First thing was I needed a mortgage to get the house, and at least until the boat is sold. So I went to the bank and said, look, I'd like to get a mortgage for a house. And they said, yeah, no problem. Just can we have your tax records from the past four years? tax what is this thing you talk of <laughs> and um, I said I haven't paid tax anywhere for 23 years <laughs> to their credit they gave me a mortgage and I bought the house and then um, so I sort of set up the, an office in the house and was doing underwater photography in, in Cairns going out on the Liverpool dive boats and it was a nice environment because that we had some very good friends there um, 
I say we, I was on my own at that time. And one day I got an email. I said, my dive instructor says you can teach me underwater photography. So I replied and said, look, if you're on Cairns, let's meet for coffee. And then I Googled the name on the email, Darren Lim Suen Sub. And the only Darren I could find was a Swedish bloke. So I thought, oh, that's a bit disappointing. Anyway, the next email said, oh, by the way, I'm in Sydney. I'm 24, Thai, and female. And my eyes lit up because I was 48, never married, always looking for a cute girl who could dive, who was interested in photography. So we got on email and then the phone. By midweek, we were on video, video cam. And at, you know, she was a thousand miles away in Sydney. At the end of the week, I proposed to her, having never met. And she said yes. And we'll have been married 17 years this year. And, um, <laughs> well, I guess you didn't make the, the wrong decision. And now I'm assuming you're in, you're in Phuket living with her. Yeah. yeah. Now, how, what was she doing in Australia at the time? She, she'd done a degree in, uh, communication arts at Chilangong University and was doing a business, uh, marketing diploma in Sydney. And, um, so anyway, she moved up to Cairns. We got married three months later. And we stayed in Cairns until she got an Australian passport, which makes her life that much easier when she travels. Um, because, it's, as you yeah, probably know, passport. it's a nightmare. Um, and the first year we were married, um, in fact, before we were married, we came to Phuket and a friend of my sister's drove us around and we were looking sort of casually at property and we saw some houses in our price range that were 60% built. So we thought, well, let's buy one. And so we bought one in Packlock, where we still live. And um, Darren's el eldest brother is an architect. So he took one look at it, 60% built. He said, ah, get rid of this wall here, put windows here, get rid of this room, and, and transformed the house into a very lovely living space. It's probably too small for us now. Um, but uh, we love it. It's very quiet, safe for the cats. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So yeah. when you're 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 making this decision to marry her quite quickly, I'm assuming you have no concept or a connection of Thai culture at this point at at, at that level. Anyways, how yeah. how did you adapt? What were the challenges? And I'm sure a lot of people in your position, when marrying a Thai girl, maybe they're not fully aware of of, of the culture and, and what to maybe be prepared for it? Or was it just smooth sailing? It was pretty smooth sailing because she's very, she's not very, very Thai. I mean, her ancestors are Chinese um, and she's very smart and highly educated. I remember, I think in the first week of conversation, she said, well, what's the difference between affect and effect i said we're in australia you don't need to worry about that <laughs> yeah they they barely know they don't even know the answer over there i lived in australia for for a year at the gold coast did you like it um I, I i i was so young so i i didn't have like money to enjoy it probably the way i should have mm. i was uh there for university um and I kind of was just in the bubble. So I was just surfing a lot. I didn't really get to go experience the rest of Australia. Mm. It, it's I, I, it, I, I'm kind of conflicted. I don't, I don't know if I would go back again. I think what I do remember it was at that time was very expensive. And I was, I was about 18 or 19. And I just do remember like the cost of groceries at that age was like astronomical. Yeah. You'd be shocked now. I mean, I would be shocked now. I haven't been back for a few years. But apparently it's got very, very expensive. Yeah, I'm, and I'm certain on certain produce, obviously certain times of years, that this is what someone was explaining to me as well. Like, well, there's only so much you can grow here as well. Now, wh when did you guys make this decision to to move to Phuket? And did you sail over here? No, I sold the boat. Um, you know, when I, when I got married, I sold the boat. I figured I can't afford a wife and a boat. Um, I can't afford it either, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the boat was out of the picture then. Um, and, you know, as I said, we came 
to Phuket for a holiday. Well, like, we came to Bangkok so I could ask Darren's father if I could marry um, his daughter. And he he said yes, but I'm sure he was rubbing his hands with glee. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, we bought the house that first year and we had to spend long enough in Australia for Darren to get permanent residency and things. So, so which which year did you kind of arrive, like settle down in Phuket? Probably 12, 12 or 13 years yeah, ago. Yeah, 2010, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was 2010. Um, yeah, basically when she got a passport, we came here permanently. Is she from Phuket or? From Bangkok. She's from Bangkok. Yeah. So how did you guys both decide Phuket with, I mean, Thailand, there's a lot of options. Well, we bought a house here. Okay, so that, that's the decision. <laughs> yeah. But even um, to make that decision, let's buy a house in Phuket. Why Phuket? Um, I suppose because of my job or, you know, because of my, what I wanted to do is work, it was one of the more convenient places because there are lots of liverboards going to Simlins and Simlins is okay diving. And it's well connected to the rest of the world with the airport. So, um, yeah, it's hard to imagine another place in Thailand that's as suitable. And we we both like it here. We got great friends here, um, and uh, yeah. What's your connection with Tony? Now Tony's been on the podcast. Tony Michelai yeah. of uh, Tones of Blue. Yeah. Um, I saw you were with him on on Songkran. How do you know Tony? I'm I'm just guessing probably from the same industry, the same world. Yeah, I I mean I I, I haven't I I don't know him very well actually, and I've only met him reasonably recently but I've known his work for longer and he's the best underwater photographer in Phuket, I think. And so I was very keen to meet him and he's a super guy, as you know, and, um, we get along. Um, but I, I love his work, but you know, he's, he's a real photographer. He's trained as a photographer. He's got a great vision. He, the post processing he does is beautiful. And, uh, yeah, I'm a great admirer. What, what's the difference between a, a real photographer and maybe someone that's trying to pick it up as a hobby? How do they transition to that next uh, professional level? It's a very good question. I think it's almost impossible now, but uh, particularly in the underwater arena. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't advise anybody to do it, to try and make a living at it now, because I think it's impossible. And writing is impossible now because if you, why? What do you mean impossible? Like oh, because nobody pays anything for it, for pictures. You know, I uh, I'd have Getty sales of less than a dollar. Um, you know, back in the day, I made quite a lot of money from Getty. It seemed to me a lot of money. Um, but you know, the 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 sales of stock pictures have, have gone down and keep going down. There are a few people who can make a living at it, and many of them run group tours. So they, um, you know, they, they get a, a commission that way. But uh, I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty much impossible. Wedding photographers that we know here, they make a, a living, and they're, yeah, they make a good living, I'd say. The, um, the, the underwater photographers like Tony, if they're not able to, you know, make a business out of the, the photos themselves? Are they transitioning now into um, classes, seminars, training programs? Um, I don't know. Tony teaches free diving, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, so he's got a few strings to his bow. And he, he's that good that people will commission him to shoot them. Um, you know, I nobody would uh, commission me to shoot that. <laughs> And my wife would say, well, your pictures are so 1970s. Mm. Um, but the, the, the problem with having this sort of genetic defect of passion for underwater photography is that it doesn't go away, and I still want to do it, even when the pictures are not as good as Tony's. Um, I was in the pool at Meridian yesterday, and, and it, it's an interesting case study because I've seen 60 meter visibility in Meridian Hotel and it's, it's world class. It's beautiful, uh, with blue sky, but you know, you, you've had, I've had to watch the weather and make an appointment on a blue sky day and have the luck that the visibility was very good, but you know, they've had a very high, a uh, very hectic high season. So the pool's not clear. 
now, and I had a model yesterday, which is there, very difficult to get hold of. And um, so the pictures are not not useful. They're, I mean, they're okay, but they're not. You know, a, a hotel needs the best pictures possible. So, when, when you're photography, when you're doing your own photography, and most of it is more marine life. Is there ever a point in your career where you capture something that's like the the highlight of your career and then possibly you end up trying to chase that that level of, of uh, fulfillment again? Um, I've been lucky. Um, I was in, in New Zealand um, many years ago, probably 15 years ago, and um, I'd spent, spent a lot of time in Fongaray in the town basin, which had good access to bars and, and uh, shops and the post office. And eventually I went out, out the, the river, down to the sea and up to Tutukaka. And on the way, I saw a whale shark feeding quite close to the coast. And I had two girls on board. And the next day we went out to look for whale sharks. We didn't find any until we were almost home. And um, there were two feeding on plankton late afternoon. I jumped in the water and I took some pictures on film. Now... There was no light, but I was able to measure the light. So I got the lab to push the film two stops, and then I got my friend Toby to scan one of the pictures and boost the exposure more. And that ran on page two of the National Daily and the front page of the local. It was the first picture of a whale shark ever shot underwater in New Zealand. And that was just complete fluke. You know, My buddy had been out every day to the poor nights hadn't seen any whale sharks. Um, and then, you know, they're not common. How, how uh, quick are they moving? About two and a half knots. Um, so just a bit quicker than you can swim when they're not trying. You know, they're, when they're just toodling around, they're actually going pretty quick mm -hmm. when it comes to... Um, but because they were feeding, they would come round and round again in the, in the Yeah, they, they have this in Philippines in a place called, I think, Oslo. Oslo. But yeah, this is there. more... Do, do you condone that or are you against what they're doing? I think there? it's fantastic. I think it's great. Um, you know, as you know, the Philippines is desperately poor and that puts millions and millions of dollars into an economy that's poverty ridden. But I, what I marvel about the Oslob thing, I mean, it's quite well controlled. Sure, it affects their behavior, but so does fishing affect fish's behavior. Um, it's a, you can imagine that once years ago, there was an old guy in a, a canoe out there fishing and a whale shark came by and he had some dried shrimp or something in the canoe that he could throw out to the whale shark and feed the whale shark. And the whale shark remembered so that the next day he could do the same thing. And then a light bulb must have gone on in this guy's head that there's a business here, I can bring tourists. And now it's huge. and. Um, yeah, I, I thought it, I, I'm a great fan of may, creating ambassadors for the marine environment. And that's one of them. And feeding sharks is another. And, um, you know, it's not something that's done here, but you could feed the black tip reef sharks at Maya Bay perfectly safely. Well, until somebody got bitten, of course. But at Oslo, it's kind of more of a, like an amusement park now. You people line up, hundreds, hundreds, yeah, hundreds. of people, yeah. and the, these whale sharks just swim in a circle, eating, so you can swim with them. It, do, yeah. Is that not in? Are they not being kind of essentially caged? Well, no, because when the feeding stops and it's only for a limited time, they swim away, and they come back the next day. But they don't have to come back, mm. but they like to because it's free food. Um, I don't. It, it does a. Um, affect their migration habits. I don't have a big problem with it. You know, I have a much bigger problem with poverty in the Philippines, and you, we can discuss the one of the causes of that poverty that we touched on earlier. Um, Definitely but, the government, but hey, maybe I got to go to the Philippines sometime. So, yeah. um, would you compare like this type of uh, marine or wildlife tourism? Is it comparable to people riding elephants, or is this two different situations? Um, it it affects people in the same way. People get very 
aggravated about riding elephants. Um, I don't know enough about elephants, only I know they're rather big and rather bigger than horses and people ride horses all the time and nobody seems to get upset about that. And I'm not quite sure whether it's just the way that um, elephants are trained to be, um, you know, to behave well amongst people. I, I don't know. But I always think it, it always seems to me a little odd that um, people are worried about other people riding elephants and yet you've got a 200 squid boats out here every night and other boats, you know, decimating reefs every day. And that's okay. I, you know, yeah, on that point, I heard a, a quote from your side that the marine life in Phuket specifically, it doesn't exist at that level that probably it used to because, well, we ate everything. Yeah. yeah. Is there any way to control that or what are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, one of the greatest ambassadors for marine reserves, I think, is the Poor Knights Marine Reserve in New Zealand, which has been a no-take zone for over 25 years. And it's, uh, I want to say, 14 miles offshore. It's a group of islands. And it's temp temperate water, but you get big shoals of big fish. And it's absolutely mind-blowing. And I think it's probably the best example in the world. Now, to make, uh, say, the two-mile limit around Phuket a no-take zone, for 25 years would take some money to pay off the fishermen, basically to buy out their ability to, to fish. But the value of a recovered marine ecosystem around Phuket would be immense. Now, of course, it's no good doing that if you've got construction runoff going into the sea and, and the clong at Kamala emptying into the sea and and other things affecting the marine environment. But the potential is there for, um, you know, a, a much better situation. Um, but like most things in Thailand, it's very difficult to actually create those spaces and make it work because of the way business is done here. Do you think a lot of let's say, is it a lost cause? Have we gone past the point of no, no return, especially when we're, we're having that discussion about marine life and like microplastics? Is there anything that we can do or is, is it, we're just gone too far? Um, and yeah, I think there are things you can do, but the, the problem is that it's very difficult to do anything about them in democracies because people don't like to vote against their own interests. Uh, but, they, you know, here you had the advantage that you know you had a military dictatorship for a while you could say to manufacturers okay you can package things in plastic it needs to be this number of plastics the the, the top needs to be the same plastic as the bottle so it can be recycled together um we're going to put a deposit of one baht or two baht on every bottle or every container um and because of the number of poor people here there would be no you know, plastic bottles on the beach because they all have value. Um, but you have to impose that on manufacturers because it's much cheaper for them to, to um, you know, just do whatever's the cheapest, whatever's most profitable. Mm -hmm. But it's possible to do. And, you know, a country like Germany has very good recycling um, standards. Um, yeah, there. I think there's a, a, a lot you can do, but... I mean, a lot of people think that um, closing Maya Bay is good because the coral recovers. It's nonsense. Maya Bay, um, I mean, it does, it does recover, that's sure, but it's completely pointless. You've got this cash cow of Maya Bay that, like the Oslob um, whale sharks, can generate huge amounts of money that can be used to basically create marine parks elsewhere by paying off the fishermen. Um, you know, with a, probably a tenth of the income from PP, you could close off Phuket for 25 years to fishing because, the, you know, the fishing effort at the moment or the, the catch is worth so little at the moment 
that to, to pay off all the fishermen plus interest for 25 years um, while they're alive um, wouldn't be particularly onerous, I would have thought. Um, I don't think there's anything you can do about the squid boats offshore and squid reproduce very quickly. I'm not sure that's much of a problem, but obviously all the things that would have eaten those squid, like sharks, don't exist because the the pressure on the squid fishery. This point of view and having these discussions maybe amongst your friends, um, are you taking the extreme point of view? Because you're going to get probably you're going to get a lot of ar- arguments back. Have you had that conversation? What are people playing yeah. devil's advocate on your own conversation? What would they respond to you? Well, they they would say, "Look, my bay's recovered the sharks. Of the sharks are here again, and that's wonderful." And blah blah blah. Um, the sharks will be there all the time if you fed them. Um, I'm sure the black tip reef sharks do come back when, when it's left alone because if when I, when I've been at atolls in the Pacific where there are no people, you have black tip reef sharks every evening in the shallows this long swimming around um, with their dorsal fins sticking out of the water. Um, but you know, compared with the revenue that can be generated by the fact that people want to go to Maya Bay, um, I think ecologically it's irrelevant. And, um, but, I, you know, I'm a great fan of setting aside other areas. But the thing is, like the Similans, it's closed half the year. Well, who has access when it's closed? And there's no oversight by dive boats, fishermen. Yeah. Um, I'm not suggesting the fishermen ever fish in, in the, the marine reserve when there's nobody looking, but it's possible. Um, you know, it may be just from a safety point of view that they don't want boats out there, um, marginal boats, getting sunk in the in the wet season out there, which is fair enough. Yeah, because I mean, the 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 water gets quite rough after May and June out there. Yeah, yeah, but there's there's a lee side of the island, so once you're out there, you're sheltered. Out out of this this entire area of southern Thailand, um, and going around in in. Uh, being involved in taking your doing your photography, is there any like hidden gems that maybe you shouldn't be telling on this podcast that to keep people away from, or something you could share? Um, I don't know of any. Um, I I I, st- I sort of stopped diving about three years ago when I had some heart operations, um, and I've been diving since to Similans and Richelieu, for example, is very rich, but I didn't see a single shark there. And um, I'm not sure why. Um, yeah, I I don't need much to enjoy myself. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't need anything particularly special. Um, I like Cobon, the Southern Bay and Cobon. Um, but you know, I'm a great fan of clear water. I can if the water's clear, I don't care if there's nothing in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I saw a leopard shark at Richelieu. That area, yeah, maybe yeah, five, are, six yeah. years ago. Um, just to kind of jump back to a, a bit where we were. One check. I want to check the time so YouTube doesn't kill us. What time? How long are we? Fifty-two. Okay, perfect time. Um, going back to your time in the French Polynesian, there's probably so many um, uncharted islands. E- even um, th- these islands where people are. There's probably no inhabitants either. When you're meeting, maybe these more secluded islands. Are, were you meeting tribes out there? What were these people like? What were they doing? Well, in French Polynesia, they're very sophisticated because I have a, a, you know, they were colonized by the French who was sophisticated, civilized people. So, um, you know, they, they knew what was going on in the world. They were um, affluent very often from farming pearls. or um, So really you weren't, in particularly in French Polynesia, you weren't meeting uh, people who are less developed, on the contrary, they're generally more developed than the, the yachties. Um, but, you know, Vanuatu is virtually Stone Age in places. So the, there's quite a big difference, even though um, Vanuatu was a condominium of France and Britain way back when. But would you interact with the locals on the island or you yeah, kept your distance? Yeah. Oh, no, no, you'd, you'd always have to interact. And in, in Fiji, you'd have to go to the the village chief with an offering of kava um, right at the beginning of your your stay and offer what's called a sevu-sevu, 
I drink kava, which is fairly disgusting. Um, yeah, so, yeah, there was always interaction with... with were, were you uh, trading with them? You would have some... You would be bringing stuff from other local islands and... Um, not so much, but the yachty... When, when we were in the Marquesas, we made great friends who are friends still, 30 years later. Um, we would trade a lot because you get to the Marquesas and you couldn't buy very much in the Marquesas. So... Um, one friend had two two bullets because he had a, a gun on board, and the locals loved two two bullets for hunting pigs, so they would trade. And then they had perfect little perfume testers, and they would trade those for coconuts or fish or lobsters. Um, and the yachties would trade things that they didn't need for things that they did need, and uh, that became quite a thing because you know you wouldn't always have a a three-quarter inch Whitworth nut in stainless steel, but one of the yachts would, and you just get on the radio and and uh, ask. And what, and were these waters... I heard some stories about a guy... Do you know, are you familiar with Hugo? I've, I've met him once. Okay. Uh, he was telling us stories like, it can get hostile out at sea. Did you ever have to carry a gun to protect yourself, or was no. it quite... Uh, you didn't have to lock the doors at night? No, no not at night. Um the, the the worst thing would be in port, some ports, you had to uh, lift the dinghy out of the water on a, on a halyard so that it was hard to steal. And quite often if you went to shore, you'd have a, a stainless steel painter and you'd lock the, the dinghy to the pier. Um, and I did have dinghy stolen, two, two actually, one in Suva, but I got it back, and another one in New Caledonia. Which I didn't get back. How, how did you get it back? You went around trying to ask. I, the I right went people? looking for it, yeah. Okay. Uh, and up every mangrove inlet around Suva Harbour, and I eventually found it, and eventually got the engine back as well. They stole your uh, engine as well. Yeah, the, the engine was on the. Did you, did you did you just find it, or did you actually find the person? Did you have to confront them? No, I didn't. Um, I went to the the police in Lamy Town, which was the local, and I offered them the carver. <laughs> um, what used to be called a bribe. <laughs> um, and they, they um, I told them I'd found the dinghy and I stole it back, basically. And I told them where it was and they, they eventually called So the, the thieves never confronted you. They kind of left it alone yeah, anyway. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Like, while Hugo was saying a lot of these islands, once you get out in the French Polynesians, it's basically incest and apples because they're kind of just interbreeding with each other anyways. Yeah, they they didn't grow apples. Or that. No, that's anyway. I guess that that's <laughs> yeah. his, his way of putting it. Did did you notice that is it could be quite incest out there? Or I mean, I can't I, I, imagine the genetic div diversity for them to interbreed. Um, I, I don't think it's a problem because there's yachts coming through all the time with good looking guys on and uh, um, <laughs> and, leave, and leaving children. So you saw yeah. a lot of uh, leaving genes behind. Yeah, there you go. Um, I, I, I never had that impression, um, really. I mean, um, yeah, I, I don't think that was really an issue. Okay. But um, maybe. And for, for yourself, well, well uh, we haven't jumped around too much, but back coming to Phuket, what's next for you? You're here. You're, this is probably where you're going to spend the rest of your life, I'm assuming. You got your house over yeah. in Packlock. Yeah. Do you have anything coming up on the horizon. You brought your book here. Are you planning to write more articles, more books? What's your future plans? That's a good question. Um, keep my wife happy, I think, is the, my main task in life. Um, I'm very content here. And, um, you know, I photograph swimming pools for fun because it's cheaper than going diving in the sea. Um, and I enjoy it. I, I, I like the technical challenges of underwater photography still. And I hope to... Do, do one or two trips with Tony and and steal all his great ideas. Mm. But he's very good with people. I mean, one of the problems I have if I, I need to shoot with a model underwater, I find it very, very difficult to find, you know, young women that can free dive and that look good underwater that have free time. You know, because, um, yeah, most people are, are, are productive and they have a job and... Yeah, generally it, it's a blue sky day and I know the day before and I need to phone somebody to say, look, are you free for two hours tomorrow? We go and shoot in this pool and do this. And 
but so that that's that's a problem. But um, yeah, I, I'm quite happy. So you know, we have two cats, and they occupy a lot of my time. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I don't because the quality of life that we have here is so high. I just feel very grateful to be able to live here and support my wife in things that she does, and and um, yeah. Well, I think that's the best part about living in Phuket. You can be content. It's a, um, whether you want to live, you know, high end luxury or live a, live a simple life, you, th those options are available. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Let's talk quick. Uh, so I, I want to let everyone know about, you brought your book with you here. Now, can people still purchase this? Like through the uh, website? I saw all the, co you said you, it, the it, last 200 copies were out of Bangkok and completely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had 200 um, copies printed, which I sold. And, um, that, but the, 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 you know, the, they weigh two kilograms. So yeah. Um, if people, w would you make this available again? It, it, no. Well, I, yeah, I don't think so. If a publisher came to me, mm. the thing is that this was a digital print, um, on an Indigo press. So they're actually quite expensive to, and the first ones I had, I think I had a 50 or a hundred done. And so the cost per copy was just a, just over a thousand. Mm. And um, so it's sort of worthwhile doing, but um, because I had smaller and smaller print runs and the cost went up, it became not worthwhile to do. I mean, if somebody wanted a hundred copies, I, I, I could do it in a heartbeat. Um, but the thing is the PDF is available free on my website as a download. Um, I, I used to uh, charge $5 for it, but then um, PayPal became unusable for people, mm. non-citizens in Thailand. So it's um, available free and it, it's, it might inspire you to, um, well, hopefully it inspire young people to, to realize that there are other paths, uh, not, not this one particularly because I don't think you can make a living doing it anymore, but, um, you know, AI has changed the world and it will change so many professions and young people need to think about the, the possibilities that are open, opening up now for a life less traveled, as it were. Well, everyone's kind of becoming smaller and smaller. Stay in your house and don't go too far. This is kind of the, uh, what's on the agenda, let's say. Um, how, if people want to reach out to you, uh, we, we, I saw they, you have your website. Um, is there anything like specific that if people are going to reach out to you that maybe you're offering um, or if they just want to say hi? Anybody, anybody, particularly underwater models. Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, happy to hear from anybody. You know, I've got plenty of spare time. I can reply to people's emails. But um, yeah, you, just peteatkinson.com is my website and um, you can message me through there. Um, and uh, go from there. Awesome. So if you're any underwater models looking to get in touch with Pete and maybe do a photo shoot, PeteAtkinson.com, pretty easy. Um, that's probably the best way to get a hold of you. And then from there, there's uh, your, your email is provided as well. Yeah, I mean, you can probably find me on, on Facebook. There's a picture of a guy underwater ascending through a bubble ring, and that, that's, that's me. Perfect. You send me a friend request. All right. Well, that we hit the probably one hour plus mark. That wraps up another episode of the Fruiting Body podcast. I so hope you enjoyed. Let us know in the comments what you thought. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, if you have any questions for Pete, you can hit him up at peteatkinson.com. Okay. Thanks a lot. We're out.